thanks to our wonderful panelists, the work they do year round to understand and support migratory birds. And thank you to our host and our guide through this journey, Ariana. Ariana is a chemist turned journalist who is passionate about exploring the world through the lens of science and discovery. When they aren't digging into the latest research on molecules and microbes, Ariana is outside looking for birds near their home in Little Rock, Arkansas. Ariana loves telling stories that help people make sense of the world and feel inspired by the wonderful wonders of science. And I'm excited to hear from them. Ariana, I'll let you take it from here. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for joining tonight. I am startled and excited to see 200 or more of you already in this event. Um, I had the great pleasure of getting to write a series of episodes about bird migration for Bird Note Daily. Um, and I hope that th that inspired some questions from y'all, the audience members, because I have got some incredible panelists here that are going to try to help us walk through all of the incredible mysteries of the journeys that migratory birds make every year, twice a year. So um, I am going to introduce the panelists who are each going to give a short presentation about a question that we sent them ahead of time. And then from there, we'll start taking audience questions. Again, please put them in the Q&A. That's going to make it easier for those questions to get to me so that I can ask it of our panelists. So um, without further ado, I'm going to start with Scott Weidensall. Um, Scott is an ornithologist and an author who celebrates the natural world, particularly birds, and bird migration uh, in his research, his writing, and his public speaking. Um, he spearheads a number of major research projects focused on bird migration and has written more than 30 books on natural history, including the Pulitzer Prize finalist Living on the Wind Across the Hemisphere with Migratory Birds, and most recently, which was featured in the series I mentioned, A World on the Wing, The Global Odyssey of Migratory Birds. Um, next, we have Marcella Castellino. Uh, Marcella is in Miramar, a, smart, gracious, a small town in the province of Cordoba, Argentina, um, on the Mar... Uh, I'm so sorry, y'all, my brain, um, <laughs> on the shore of Mar Chiquita Lake, uh, which is one of the largest saline lakes in the world and one of the most important sites for shorebirds in the southern cone of South America. Um, for the last 10 years, she has dedicated herself to research and conservation of shorebirds, particularly Wilson's ferrolopes, studying aspects of their ecology and distribution in their non-breeding areas of South America. In 2019, she joined the Western Hemisphere Shorebird Research Network as the exec in the executive office team as the Flyways Conservation Specialist, focused on the conservation of inland salt saline lakes and their shorebirds. As part of her role, she promotes the process of declaring Mar Chiquita a national park um, and start with more than half a million individual uh, birds coming through each summer. Uh, she also has a degree in biology from the National University of Cordoba. And finally, I also have Julia Wang, who is a BirdCast project leader with the Cornell Lab of Ornithology. Julia designs and runs the Lights Out campaigns that are informed by current migration forecasts with the aim of encouraging all levels of society, from individuals to government, to adopt this conservation practice. Her goal is to translate the lab's research into on the ground action that saves the lives of birds. So um, I'm going to start with, uh, with questions for each of our panelists, starting with Julia. So Julia, um, BirdCast is an incredible piece of technology. It uses radar, the principles of radar to help us understand the migration of birds. Um, and it's really important for the Lights Out campaigns that you've designed. I wonder if you can talk to tell folks a little bit about um, how this technology works, uh, what the Lights Out campaigns are, and how people in their homes can, can help to protect migratory birds. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you for the introduction. I've put together a couple of slides to provide a visual element to help answer that question. Uh, give me one second to share a screen and I'll get started. That visible to everyone? Wonderful. Okay. 
So to begin with, as previously mentioned, I'm a BirdCast project leader. BirdCast is a consortium of researchers, including researchers at the Cornell Lab of Ornithology, Colorado State, uh, UMass Amherst, and other institutions interested in the question of where birds are, uh, when, and in what magnitude, when are they moving, um, and what magnitudes, direction, speeds. And so we try to answer those questions using radar. Um, to sort of set the scene, as I'm sure many of you are aware, we've had some des devastating losses in bird populations since the 1970s, including um, huge losses in migratory birds. And so with BirdCast, we hope not only to be able to better understand birds for pleasure and birding um, and general interest, but also to apply our better understanding of migratory bird patterns and populations to conservation action. Uh, as you may or may not know, about 80% of North American migrants actually migrate at night, which makes studying them often quite difficult as they're typically migrating at uh, fairly high altitudes. And so previously we've looked at migration through um, on the ground observation, through sound recordings and through visual identification, but it's often an incomplete picture due to the difficulty of tracking so many birds so high in the atmosphere. Enter, oh, there we go. Enter radar. So here is a map of the radar or weather surveillance radar stations across the continent of the US. Um, radar was originally developed during World War II uh, to detect enemy planes. And the sort of basic way that it works is um, it sends out an electromagnetic pulse into the atmosphere. And whatever it makes contact with as it moves out from the station, it reflects back. Um, to the station. And so we're able to detect things in the atmosphere, um, including primarily weather um, and enemy planes. But beyond that, there were a bunch of things detected by radar that were initially called angels because we weren't sure what they were. And through on-the-ground observation, we discovered that there was a lot of biological data that was actually reflected back from um, the radar. And so um, what we're now able to see and corroborate with on the ground observers is that we can detect when birds, bats, and insects are on the air using, are in the air, sorry, using radar. And so if you take a look at this scan right here from a few years ago, um, you can see that there's a bunch of information around most of these stations, um, but here in the sort of Midwest and Eastern regions, um, these irregular bands, if you will, are typically um, precipitation and these non-irregular bands, which look fairly different, are usually biological um, data, which includes birds, bats, and insects. And so Nowadays, after a couple of decades of advance, advancements in radar, including the dual polarization of radars in, about 10 years ago, um, as well as advancements in analytics and machine learning, we're able to essentially sort out that information um, and look at that discarded da data up and separ separate out what is birds, what is insects, and what is bats. So here is one of the products that we're able to produce using that separated out data. Uh, we call these bird migration forecasts and we provide bird migration forecasts on our website for uh, three days. This is the night of October 27th. And so here you can see um, using the scale on the side that the areas that are brightest, if you will, warmer colored yellows and whites are where the major migration pulses are, um, but there's migration happening in most places at most times during the migration season. And that's reflected in this map as well. Um, what you see going down approximately the middle of the map, the gray line delineations are weather systems. And so we provide those for interest as well as typically, um, despite the fact there are 192 million birds predicted going overhead during migration, through this one night, you might not see a lot of them because they may be moving overhead at very high altitudes, but where migration intersects with weather systems, you may see fallout. And so we provide that information on our maps as well. Here is a live bird migration map as we also provide um, live updates throughout the night about where birds are moving in addition to our forecast. Um, and so there's information on the map as well as you may see 
see with the arrows about direction um, of migration. So that's sort of the basic understanding about BirdCast, what it does, some of the products that we produce. And so now we can talk about a little about how we use them beyond just general scientific understanding and general interest. Um, so BirdCast is really interested in applying all of our research to on the ground conservation. And the project that we're currently um, greatly involved in is called Lights Out Texas, which is one of over 30 Lights Out campaigns in the US. And so I work for the lab in BirdCast to coordinate um, this project. And so uh, to begin with the pictures on the right, um, this was all sort of kicked off in Texas, uh, I believe in 2017 after a mass mortality incident at the building pictured, which uh, is in Galveston. Um, over the course of a single night um, during inclement conditions, about 400 birds uh, struck the building you see pictured and passed away. Uh, following that, we began implementing uh, light out protocols as light pollution is a major threat to birds that increases collisions as I'll discuss in the next couple of slides. So here you see the 9-11 uh, Memorial Tribute in Light in New York City. Uh, we monitor that every year. Um, as what happens is birds are disoriented and drawn towards urban light a lot of the times. And so all of those swirling little specks that look a bit like insects are actually birds, hundreds and hundreds of birds swirling in those lights. Every year we work with New York City Audubon as well as the memorial organizers in order to turn off lights in about 20 to 30 minute increments, during which time we found that birds actually disperse really well. So here um, is actually a scan of bird density right over the tribute in light uh, on, from 2015. And if you look to the right, you can see um, how dense the birds can get when the uh, tribute is on versus the dispersal. Here is unfortunately a collection of collisions um, collected, I believe, by FLAP, which is a program that began Lights Out initially in Canada and then helped it begin in the US a couple of decades prior. Um, it's a problem, collisions are a problem that we're very concerned about as estimated annual mortality from collisions is at around 365 to 988 million per year. And light pollution is one of many factors is exacerbating that. So here is a estimated annual mortality from collision threats to birds graphic that sort of breaks it down um, based on the human structure that we're talking about. And as you can see, buildings and residences make up a huge, huge number of those collisions. And so there are, there's a lot of focus on how we can reduce collisions specifically in those areas. And one of the ways that we can do so is by impacting the light pollution that draws birds into urban areas and makes them more susceptible to collisions. So here I've added a picture of McCormick Place in Chicago. I believe it's the US's largest convention center. And prior to implementing Lights Out protocols, it was a bit of a notorious bird killing as a function of all of the glass, as well as its sort of lakefront position. Um, and so there were a bunch of birds dying here. Uh, and so I believe they conducted a two-year collision monitoring study where they turned off um, some lights throughout the buildings and found that approximately um, there was an approximately 83% average decrease in bird collision mortalities when lights were turned off versus when they were turned on. There were some, I believe, 1,700 birds killed striking lit windows as opposed to 190 or so birds striking darkened windows, whether by turning off lights or drawing drapes at this building during that collision monitoring study. So. I put this up as an example of the effectiveness of the intervention. We do know that turning lights off or drawing drapes to reduce light pollution, overall reducing light pollution reduces collisions. And so how does that tie into BirdCast? 
bring us back to our question. Um, the answer is that a lot of the times there are implementation problems in getting people to turn off lights. I think that uh, light pollution is often a bit of an underrecognized problem as a lot of the collisions um, aren't detected, whether due to uh, removal from urban predators or scavengers or due to cleaning crews in the morning sweeping up carcasses. And so a lot of the time, it's not something we discuss until there's a mass mortality event like the ones that occurred in New York City or Philadelphia or Texas over the last couple of years. And so what we hope to do is first of all, raise awareness of the problem, but second of all, bring a better understanding of migration of, and the dangers of light pollution and the particularly critical periods during migration when it's especially important to protect birds if for some reason there are implementation problems in reducing turning off lights on a full year or full migration season basis. And so looking at the historical data, we've been able to determine that most um, migratory movements actually happen on a very limited number of nights during the full migration seasons. So we try to help organizations like city governments, um, building owners and managers associations and other such organizations target their action um, to these specific nights so that they can make the most impact if for some reason they have other lighting commitments that, they, that means they can't reduce lighting as is often the case. So, Looking at this historical data, we've also been able to determine um, average peak migration dates for the continental US, specifically in Texas, for instance. This period is about six weeks, I want to say, in the spring and a little less, about a month and a half in the fall. And that's the period that we define as um, about 50% of migratory birds moving within a specific window. Beyond those sorts of narrowing down implementation um, guides that we would provide to buildings and organizations. We also provide a, another product um, that we've recently betaed called Lights Out Alerts. And that's something that we can help, can, ah, sorry, can't talk. We hope can help not only these buildings, organizations, city government officials, et cetera, et cetera, but also the average person with um, a interest in migration or a desire to help with conservation action know when birds are in their areas. So what you can do with this tool is you can enter your your area, whatever your city or location is in the continent of the US, and it'll localize um, our migration forecast for you so that you know uh, which specific predicted class of migration you're going to get that night, low, medium, or high, and we issue what we call a lights out alert on nights that there are high migration, asking people to turn off or dim or reduce whatever lighting indoor or outdoor is possible on those nights. So uh, here I've provided some guidelines for everyone about what sort of lighting to reduce. Um, we recommend reducing lighting from 11 to 6 a.m. each night during migration in so much as possible. Um, but if uh, you're unable to do so, we re recommend reducing lighting during nights of high migration and during peak migration windows. Um, the specific guidelines include uh, concerns about vegetation, glass, um, and et cetera. So we ask people not to light up trees or gardens where birds may be resting. We ask that essential, whatever essential lighting that you're gonna leave on be either sort of aimed downward, shielded, um, put on a motion detector or a timer so that it's not omnipresent and birds have a chance to disperse or not be disturbed by them throughout the night. And since indoor and outdoor lighting both affect uh, birds which we found in a actually a study earlier this year at the McCormick building, actually, we asked that you close blinds at night as well, just to prevent that light from escaping. And so those are some of the personal measures that people can take. But uh, I encourage everyone, oh yeah, I also encourage everyone who is in the position to do so to reach out to their community and raise awareness about this. So. Uh, you might remember this building from a couple of slides ago. It was the Galveston National Insurance Building where that mass mortality event happened. Uh, so after that incident, the building immediately reached out to Houston Audubon and asked for help implementing measures because there were a bunch of birders who were 
who proactively wanted to reduce the risk that something like this was going to happen again. And through the work that we've done the last couple of years, we found that a lot of the times people are really receptive to the solution. They just aren't aware of either the problem or the solution and need help implementing it. So we recommend that you reach out. Um, we're also in the process with working with a bunch of city governments in Texas specifically right now, including Dallas, but also including Austin, um, San Antonio, Houston, and a bunch of other cities across the state in implementing uh, lights out nights during the peak windows that Birdcast has helped us to identify so that we have a coordinated effort, not only from private citizens like yourselves, but also from city government and building owners and associations. Because ultimately, while turn uh, turning off light always helps, every window matters, every light matters, um, light pollution is a problem that affects all of us, and ultimately, we all need to participate in to make a difference. Um, so that's the basic overview. <laughs> There's a bunch more information contained at our website, so I've provided a couple of links here, as well as a email address if there isn't a time to get to like every question that's asked during this. Excellent. Julia, thank you so much for that incredible overview. We've got so many questions already in the Q&A. Thank <laughs> you, everyone who submitted those questions. Um, I, I truly had so much fun exploring the BirdCast website, birdcast.info, and I highly encourage our audience members to go look out, look at all of the different resources that are there. Um, Julia, I'm going to return questions to you once we have gotten through, uh, once I've managed to ask Marcella and Scott questions as well. Um, and so uh, the next question is for Marcella. So one of the aspects of uh, researching this migration series that I wrote that I thought was so interesting is this idea that, you know, birds live, uh, migratory birds specifically, live across flyways. And when we're thinking about trying to protect migratory birds, um, we have to think about where they stop over uh, on the way, and especially with shorebirds, where they might spend time not on the shore. Um, and so I, I given that you are a flyway conservation specialist, I was hoping that you could talk to our audience about those particular challenges and um, your work with Manomet, specifically with Marchiquita Lake. Okay, yeah, thanks. Thanks so much for uh, to the Berno team for having me here and th thanks so much, Ariana, for the introduction and the question. Uh, I will try to answer uh, and all of that um, very briefly. I, yes, my, my answer will be focused in shorebird, migratory shorebird, because uh, it's the, work, the bird group that I have been working for the past years. And I think that it's very crucial that we have in mind that we have to preserve all the habitats that are using across the, the, their flyways, because these uh, shorebirds are relying in different sites in the different time of the year during their life cycle, the annual life cycle, they are relying on different sites, different type of habitats. And these habitats have has different characteristics, offer different resources to the shorebirds in specific, specific times of the year. And uh, also, um, since they are widespread in the, in the hemisphere, um, they are facing different threats. Uh, not all threats are affecting the sites in the, in the same way. So we have to have that in mind. And we need to uh, protect all the sites because this is a chain and the shores are relying on every site along the, the flyway. So we have to protect all of them. And in order to be able to protect them, we have to uh, know where the sites are and what is the use the shores are doing of those sites. So um, I think that to be able to understand uh, when and where we have to do conservation actions and which conservation actions we need to undertake or support is very important uh, to uh, conduct. For example, the, the Lindsay story that was shared, um, um, these kind of, of researchers following the migration routes make help us to understand the sites that we have to put our attention and our efforts uh, across the, the hemisphere. And as you mentioned, it's true that not all shorebirds are um, relying on the coastal areas because I probably many of, of you are thinking that shorebirds are 
in the in the coast, in the coastal habitats, in the Pacific, in the Atlantic. But many, many of them, because this is a very diverse uh, group, needs using a wide variety of habitats. Many of them are relying on inland uh, habitats that can be very variable. They can be, for example, grasslands. They can be uh, some productive systems like, for example, rice fields, but also uh, interior wetlands. And I will be focusing the next couple of minutes in inland saline wetlands because that is uh, the focus of my work. And in order to be able to protect the, the birds that are used in those sites and those sites, we have to work. I, I want to mention this. Uh, I'm sorry. Um, we need to work on the sites uh, with the partners. So I, I'm part of the Western team, the Western Hemisphere Shore Reserve Network. And that is a conservation initiative that works to support the um, shore bear populations by preserving their habitats across the Western Hemisphere. Currently, we have 112 sites in 18 countries in the Americas, and we work with over 400 uh, partners in distributed in all these sites. And us, as a Western team, are supporting those uh, partners in different activities like good governance processes, monitoring of shore bear population, site assessments, uh, community engagement and outreach and monitoring. And, and also we're working to strengthen the connections between the sites and, and the partners because uh, we have to think in this big picture that servers are relying on a whole network of sites. So we have to work together and we can support each other and learn, learn each other from experiences. And we can also um, join efforts to uh, uh, undertake certain activities of monitoring or research, for example. And um, going back to the, to the inland saline lakes, uh, one of the, the main efforts that we are uh, doing in South America is to better understand the use of the inland saline wetlands. Uh, there are mainly in the high Andean and in the lowlands of Argentina. Um, there is um, this, this ecosystem, the, the saline wetlands, the inland saline wetlands are amongst the most threatened ecosystem on earth. They are very, um, they are very fragile because there are like close basins, like endorheic basins, where the water balance is is um, very delicate between the water that flows into the systems and the water that goes by evaporation or other uh, other activities, extraction, for example. So there are threatened and there are uh, uh, exposed to different, uh, yeah, to different threats. And we are trying to, Wilson's Falarok, the species that I have been working in the past years, is one of the shorebirds, not only the only shorebird, but one of the shorebirds that are relying on this kind of habitats. They are highly adapted to these environments and they are highly dependent on the, of these inland saline lakes. So we are trying to understand better uh, how they use these habitats, what are the key sites that we are not yet identified, mainly in South America, to and assess the threats that are facing the as a team have been uh, coordinating was simultaneous surveys in south america in 2020 we conducted a simultaneous survey in over 700 sites to understand where the follow-ups are and what is the timing and the movements and in we repeated the surveys in the following summers and he, now in Mar Chiquita, we are undertaking simultaneous surveys, um, monthly basis surveys, I'm sorry, to understand better the, the habitat use for the species here and also trying to see, because this is one of the main winter sites for the species, over a half million polarops are relying on this particular site every summer, Austral summer. We are um, monitoring the local population to try to understand what is happening with the global population to see, to uh, try to identify any trends in the populations. And also we are supporting here at Mar Chiquita um, the process of the declaration of a national park um, that will be protecting not only the habitat for phalaropes, but also for over 30 shorebird species that are relying in different times of the year of this uh, environment and yeah uh, all these actions like research and monitoring and and 
tracking the migrations and uh, working on the sites help us understand better uh, what are the actions that we need to, to do and which are the sites, the key sites that we need to, to protect to ensure the conservation of the shorebird populations. And the last thing that I, I want to mention is like um, in the Americas, we have these three main flyways. We have the uh, Pacific Flyway and we have the Atlantic Flyway uh, that are uh, related to shorebirds that are used in these coastal habitats. But we also have a mid-continent flyway, and that flyway includes all these habitats, inland, inland habitats that I have mentioned. And uh, the, both the Pacific and the Atlantic flyway has been receiving in the past years uh, more, more, more attention conservation of shorebirds than the mid-continent, but in the past year, uh, Manomet, together with other agencies, is leading the development of the mid-continental shorebird conservation strategy. That is a conservation strategy directed to protect, to identify, to protect uh, these habitats that are important for shorebirds that are relying on these different habitats and identifying the key actions that we need to undertake, the key partners that we need to work with and try to we are developing a strategic plan to uh, ensure that our conservation efforts has the best uh, result that we can, that is the protection of our shore populations. Excellent. I want to ask just a quick follow up question about that, because, um, you know, one of the concerns that listeners have brought up and even audience members now is the growing threat of climate change. Um, and I wonder if you can just talk talk briefly about why it's so important um, to do these kinds of migratory or how these kinds of migratory studies learning about where the birds actually go is so important, especially given the ways that habitats are changing. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, habitat, uh, sorry, climate change is certainly a, a major threat for shorebirds and in general for the biodiversity, but for shorebirds in particular. And it doesn't, it do not affect in the same way, for example, shorebirds that are relying on, on coastal habitats than shorebirds that are relying on in coastal habitats, we are expecting low of the sea level and in the inland, uh, wetlands, we are expecting the, a dry out because due climate change, many are, areas are expected to become more drier and more hotter than others. And many of these inland solid wetlands are located in these areas. So um, that together with other threats that are related to human activities, for example, in inland saline lakes, is very common the water diversion from the main tributaries for activities like um, agriculture or human consumption, or even here in the Altiplano in South America, mining, lithium mining, for example, is one of the main threats. So the water diversion together with these uh, climate change conditions are accelerating the, the, the process of the degradation of the habitats uh, for inland shorebird, for, for inland habitats and the shorebirds that are relying on those habitats. So that it, that's because it's important to know which size are, are key for, for, the, for the species and to be able to um, apply conservation actions or support conservation actions on those specific sites to regulate and to manage those sites in the best way that we can to preserve these shorebird populations. Excellent. That is fascinating and so interesting. I Feralopes are some of my favorite birds to watch. Um, you know, when I'm out on the water, they have such a quirky way about them. Um, and it's so interesting <laughs> yes. to think about this huge journey that they go on um, to, to be on yeah. these saline lakes uh, this time of year, right? In the overwintering time. Yeah. Feralopes are very challenging to follow, I have to say. <laughs> um, because we are, they are very hard to, to track. There is many technologies out there to track uh, migratory birds, but particularly for Wilson's Palerop is kind of uh, a challenge because um, they are uh, really hard to recapture, for example, and they are really, really hard to capture in the first place, but recapture to get the information back. So, and the size of the transmitters is also a, a, a limitant for, for the species and 
So it's, it's kind of tricky. So that's why in South America, at least, we are relying on monitoring and visiting the sites and make these surveys. And yeah, we are receiving the, the follow-ups here uh, now from September, we are receiving the first follow-ups and we are waiting the peak in November, December. And yeah, we are hoping to be able to track follow-ups in the near future, but we still do not have that uh, opportunity. So I will be sharing the news when we have it. <laughs> Excellent. Well, as before, I have so many more questions, but I want to make sure that we get a chance that I get a chance to ask Scott a question. And then um, again, thank you to everyone for putting your questions in the Q&A so that we can uh, ask them in this next section. But first, I want to talk to Scott. Um, your books, you've written, you've written multiple books on bird migration. And one of the aspects of them that I find so interesting and exciting is that, you know, humans have been watching migratory birds for for a lot a long time very long time um and the impact that that we are having now is is very is acute um but i wonder you know with your kind of expansive knowledge of the natural history of these animals what do you see as as being the next mystery for us to to unravel to to try to explore with migratory birds. Well, I think you're right. I mean, we've we we as a we as humans have been paying attention to migratory birds probably for as long as we've been human. I mean, they've been marking the seasons for us since forever. And we just keep, you know, we keep peeling back the onion and finding all of these new layers in terms of their navigational abilities and orientation abilities and physiological abilities, you know, the fact that you know, there's little Wilson's phalaropes are, are are making a, you know, a journey of probably close to 17,000 miles a year. Um, you know, you've got black pole warblers tonight that are probably off the northeastern coast on their way to Venezuela. They're going to fly for 90 hours nonstop and beat their wings 4 million times. Um, you know, up here where I live in New England, Arctic terns that breed off the coast of Maine are going to be wintering in the Indian Ocean. I and mean, it's just kind of, kind of gobsmackingly astounding what birds can do. As far as as far as mysteries go, um, you know, we still only have, I think, a partial understanding of how migratory birds navigate and orient themselves in the landscape. Just in the last couple of years, one of the big mysteries about bird migration appears to have been solved, which is how do birds tap into the Earth's magnetic field? We've known, we've known since the 1850s that birds have a magnetic sense. And when I was in college in the 1970s and took ornithology, we were taught that birds had this tiny little deposits of magnetic crystals called magnetite at the base of their bill or in their brains. And um, it was the thought it was, I, I just sort of pictured it like a little compass, you know, kind of hold their nose to the north and drag them off. And it turns out that's not at all the case. You know, birds are using a form of quantum physics known as quantum entanglement, radical pair theory, that is like something ripped out of a science fiction novel. And will probably eventually allow us to develop faster than light communication and unhackable quantum computers. And birds have been using it for probably millions of years in order to visualize the Earth's magnetic field. But they also seem to have another magnetic sense that may be tied into their map sense. Some people speculate it's based in the trigeminal nerve that runs down their beak. We don't, we don't know. Um, and every time we, every time we, un, you know, we unlock one of these mysteries, it seems like there's three or four more in there. I mean, in a broader sense, I think one of the big areas of mystery about bird migration is what's going on offshore. You know, thanks to, you know, the work of BirdCast and our ability to, to harness the Doppler radar network, we have a pretty good sense of how many birds are migrating over land, as Julia explained. And by the way, that is just, it, it, it blows my mind that we, I can, I can go on to bird on bird casting any given night, and it will say 685.4 million birds are in flight right now over, over North America and and or over the lower 48. It's really just the U.S. that um, is encompassing that. And I've had, I can't tell you, Julia, how many people have asked me, you know, how are they making those numbers up? And it's like, no, 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 that's not, that's a real legit number. But we don't have that out over the oceans, and so we have you know, tens to hundreds of millions um, of, of migratory seabirds. And in some cases, we don't even know what hemispheres these birds are migrating in. Storm petrels, albatrosses, shearwaters, petrels, um, you know, uh, 
couple of years ago, a Tahiti petrel showed up off the coast of North Carolina in what we would assume is the wrong ocean for a bird that breeds in the Southwest Pacific. But the fact is, we don't really know what constitutes the right ocean for a bird like that. Um, Swinhoe storm petrel um, kept showing up in small numbers off the coast of, off the eastern coast of North America, which is kind of bizarre because so far as we knew, they only bred around the Yellow Sea in China and off Japan. And then scientists discovered a small colony breeding on an island off Morocco. And um, a couple of years ago, in fact, twice in the last couple of years, a, a completely unknown petrel has been sighted off, again, off the coast of North Carolina out on the Gulf, on, in the Gulf Stream. And it's known as the Whiskey Tango Foxtrot Petrel because when people saw this, they said, WTF, we have no idea what this is. Um, they don't know if it's a like a hybrid. Is it an unknown plumage of a known species? Is it a completely unknown species? So I think really the, the, the big remaining mystery about migration, kind of the unknown country, is what's going on with, with pelagic um, seabird migration all over the world. And these are the birds that are traveling farther than any other birds. I mean, you know, you have short-tailed shearwaters from Tasmania that travel 44,000 miles around the Pacific in these giant figures of eight. And um, as I said, you know, Arctic terms from, from Maine traveling 51 to 60,000 miles a year on their migration. We don't really know what pelagic seabirds are capable of doing. We don't really know where they're going. But as tracking technology is changing, as it's becoming more miniaturized, it gives us more opportunities to find out what even the smallest migratory birds are doing across hemispheric distances, um, you know, that's, that's opening up that, that realm for us. And it's giving us an opportunity to connect where these birds are going with our own lives. And, and this is something that has had real resonance with my life. I grew up in the mountains of Eastern Pennsylvania and 50 years ago this year, when I was 12 years old, my parents took me to Hawk Mountain Sanctuary along the Kittatinny Ridge in Pennsylvania. And I was mesmerized by the sight of hundreds of hawks and eagles and falcons pouring down the Kittatinny Ridge that day and talking to the other birders up there and hearing that, you know, these are peregrine falcons that are coming from Greenland that are going to be down in, on the shores of Marchiquita feeding on Wilson's, um, Wilson's phalaropes in the wintertime, that broad-winged hawks that were migrating over my house were going to be spending the winter in Peru or Colombia. I mean, birds bind the world together in a way that almost no other natural phenomenon does. And, you know, in some of the work I've done, we've tried very directly to make that connection with people. In fact, one of the projects I'm involved in is called Critical Connections. And it's, it's a study of bird migration on the national parklands in Alaska, especially Denali National Park. And you know, critical connections and connections between the breeding grounds in the north and where these birds are traveling to on the wintering grounds, but also drawing connections between where the birds in Alaska are going on their migration and connecting that to the communities from whom people are coming to the park to visit. So, you know, if you come to Denali and you're from Georgia, the fox sparrows that breed in the park probably winter in your backyard. Um, Wilson's, Wilson's warblers going to Central America, um, great cheeked thrushes going to Northern South America, Arctic warblers wintering in the Philippines or the island of Palau, Northern weed ears traveling all the way across Asia and wintering in East Africa. Um, and also to see with the research we're doing, the really tight, tight connections between where these birds are coming from and where they're going. For example, one of the species we've been studying in Denali for the last seven or eight years are Swainson's thrushes. And this is one of the northernmost breeding populations of Swainson's thrushes in the world. And we kind of suspected based on what we know about how migration usually works, usually the northernmost populations travel the farthest south. Well, it turns out that the Swainson's thrushes that we tagged in, in Alaska are traveling to the borderlands between Bolivia and Argentina to spend the winter. And not just that, we have we have um, Swainson's thrushes that we've tagged within a mile of each other in Denali National Park that have flown almost 9,000 miles to northern Argentina and spent the winter within about 20 kilometers of each other in the, on the eastern slope of the Andes in this really narrow elevational band of forest. Um, that's 
called migratory connectivity. And that kind of really tight migratory connectivity is, is just remarkable. But it also shows how, you know, we have, in terms of conservation, we have to look at every part of this bird's annual cycle if we're going to have a prayer of saving it. The, the fate of birds that breed in one of the most remote tundra wildernesses in North America is bound up with agricultural development in the, uh, in the mountain lands of, of Argentina and eastern slope of the Andes. And I don't think this comes as a surprise to anybody who's listening to this tonight. We've known for a long time that we, that we, need, to, we, we need to understand a, a bird's entire life cycle. We need to protect all the elements of it. Um, but all of this new tracking technology, all of this new ability to tap into big data sets like, like eBird and, and radar, um, you know, the, the ability pretty soon probably to tap into our, um, all of the nocturnal flight calls that these birds are, are vocalizing as they're flying south to capture that with rooftop antennas. And, you know, the folks at Cornell are working on this through their BirdVox program to, to have a way for all that information to come into one place and automatically identify and quantify those birds so that we can paint in the details of what species are in the night air. So we, can, we, we don't just have to say that there are tens of millions and hundreds of millions of birds migrating over, over the US tonight, but how many of them are Grachy thrushes and Swainson's thrushes and wood, wood thrushes and Swainson's warblers and on and on and on. That is powerful, powerful information that comes just at, just I think in the nick of time for us to use it for the benefit of these birds. And I wish I had, a, I wish I had like gorgeous images and footage of zillions and zillions of Wilson's phalaropes flying around like Marcella had um, to, 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 to give something, uh, give people something to look at while I was talking there. Well, I mean, that's, it's just fascinating. Um, I, to the audience, I cannot recommend enough Scott's books. They are beautifully written and uh, for what, without, I feel like I can see these images just from how incredible the stories are in, in your writing. So with that, I really wanna open this up to all of the panelists. Thank you to everyone who has submitted questions via the Q&A feature. Um, we are going through those now to make sure that we can address them in time. I wanna start by, uh, with kind of a, a broad question to everyone because um, sometimes, with everything going on in the world and a lot of the news around bird mass casualty events, I think that it's easy to sometimes feel hopeless. Um, and to tr I, I know that on an individual level, it often doesn't feel like one person can make that much of a difference. Uh, Julia, you've given us some really incredible uh, resources about what we can do in our homes to try to help during migration season. But I guess I want to ask each of y'all. Um, you know, what do you think, if, if you could have one kind of action item that people take home with them from this, or if you could think about what kinds of considerations people should take when choosing their action item. For example, I have a yard, I'm trying to plant native plants. Um, what would you recommend? And then also as a second point, um, what, what keeps you optimistic? Well, I'll, let me just take a stab at, at your last question first. The resilience of birds, the resilience of nature, which I think has surprised me over and over again. I grew up in the Appalachians, which are a very badly bruised ecosystem. I grew up on the, on the edge of coal country in the Appalachians of Pennsylvania. I mean, that's as battered an ecosystem as you can find. But with time, you know, it recovers to a degree. And... Um, I'm not whitewashing the challenges that are facing birds, but um, but but birds are tough, and I think I think they 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 have surprised me many times by um, by their resiliency. I think if we give them half a chance, um, they've got a they've got a pretty good chance. That, you know, but but we but we have to, we have to mobilize ourselves, and you know it's under. You're right. I mean, the challenges seem so great, but. We're making progress. Um, you know, we have we like for example. Let me just get. We, we know that we lost almost three billion birds in the last fifty years, and groups of, of birds like grassland birds are in desperate, desperate shape. But that same paper that do, that documented that we've lost two point nine billion birds also documented that in the last fifty years, wetland birds and waterfowl have bounced back dramatically. Why? Because we poured a huge amount of money and time and resources and political will 
into saving and restoring and protecting wetland habitats. Um, you know, uh, things looked pretty grim in the mid in the mid '80s for waterfowl, and they bounced back in a big way. So, you know, the group of birds in the worst shape in North America are grassland birds, but that is in significant part a habitat problem, and we can do the same thing for grassland birds that we've done for wetland birds. Um, it just it just comes to it, it comes down to enough of us who care about birds making birds a priority, making sure that our elected officials know they're a priority, um, and just and just beating the drum as long and hard as we need to. Uh, that's a great answer, and I'll definitely second that. Um, I think one of my sources of optimism is thinking about reversals like that as well. Uh, the ability of birds to come back when we do make that change. I mean, personally, I know I grew up in school reading about um, DEET and peregrine, peregrine falcons, birds of prey, that sort of thing, and thinking about their comebacks when we really put our minds to doing something about it, their ability to bounce back is truly amazing. And so I'm super concerned and like beating the drum about songbirds and lights out right now because they are uh, in such danger. But like my spirits are high and I'm optimistic about it. First of all, because we've been able to raise a great amount of attention to the cause. Second of all, because we know that we've managed to reverse bird trends before. And third of all, because there's been a lot of talk, I think, over the last two years specifically with everything going on and a lot more people being home about um, new birders, young birders becoming interested in birding. And I think that's really promising and gives me hope for the future. And so that's sort of my addendum to that part of the question. As for the others, I don't know that I could really give one action item. My, my biggest one is, of course, um, lights, turning off lights during migration season. And as best as you can, changing your lighting to the most bird friendly and the most dark skies friendly lighting that you can on sort of a personal level. Um, in addition, on a personal level, though, you know, keeping cats indoors, putting stickers on windows, all of those things, planting native plants in the backyard. Since we know these are all major sources of mortality for birds and major opportunities for us to make a difference. But beyond all of us banding together as individuals to do what we can, um, there really needs to be an effort from government, from business. And so throwing your support behind organizations that work to change government and business practice so that we can implement larger scale programs and sort of embed these changes in the way that we do things as a broader society. I think that's what we can do. Yes. So I, I don't think that I have much to add to the first question about the why. The, the optimistic view. I, I, I share the, the 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 answers from uh, from Julia and Scott. I also remain optimistic because I agree that I think there is a increase in the in the awareness and the, the people is getting more interested and wanted to know and learn how they can help, how they can contribute, and also because there are increasing tools and technologies and resources that we can use to help to restore or maintain the population of, of birds. So I, I'm optimistic, optimi optimistic about that. And I will be referring to the second part. As, I'm sorry, I think it's the first part of the question is about the, the uh, yeah, the, about the things that we can do individually. And thinking of short birds, for example, I would like to share there is, if you live in a, in a Side that is important for shorebird in different side of the migratory uh, journey. For example, disturbances are a high source of um, human activities on the beaches. For example, are, are a high source of disturbances in many cases. So the, the birds are exhausted; they need to rest and feed. Uh, so be careful where you walk. Be careful if you take your dog with a leash. Um, if you drive an ATV or things like that, that will be very helpful for shorebirds that are resting and using those sites after long, long journeys. And also, I think that is very important if you like to go outside and count birds and enjoy nature, but you also enjoy making lists and ident identifying shorebirds, uh, you can join to many uh, different initiatives of citizen science that contribute to create information and help us to uh, understand what is happening and um, have more and better data for uh, direct the conservation actions. And I want to say that for shorebirds, we have ISS, that is the International Shorebird Survey at Manumet. 
So you can become a volunteer. You can upload your data to uh, Ebert as a volunteer of ISS, and you will be helping us to understand better what is happening with Shorebirds. Thanks. Excellent. I, I love eBird. Um, it makes me feel like I'm being helpful while I walk around <laughs> in the woods on my lunch break. Um, it, it's, uh, we'll be sure to also give a link to that in the chat for those of you who, have, who aren't familiar. It's an incredibly cool resource. Um, I've got a question uh, for Scott and Julia specifically about um, what techniques can be used to improve the study of pelagic seabird migration? Um, Vessel-based radar at, at sea, at sea human observation, like what, what do we need technology-wise to start answering some of those questions? Ooh, um, well, I, I don't know if Julia's got any ideas on the, on the technological side. I think, I, think, I mean, in improvements in tracking technology um, uh, both in terms of miniaturization and um, lowered prices, because I mean, some of, some of these transmitters are thousands of dollars a piece. Um, that's going to that's going to make a, a big difference. Um, and the, the difficulty is most of this migration occurs in in you know deep ocean spots where there just are no human observers. Um, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's expensive to get research vessels and observation vessels out there. Um, you know, a lot of what we have along the, uh, the North American coasts are, are uh, National Oceanographic and Atmospheric Administration um, research vessels, NOAA, NOAA research vessels that are often doing, you know, running these long transects off the West Coast, the East Coast, the Gulf Coast, often um, counting marine mammals, but they'll, but they'll have, um, observers on there doing um, doing pelagic bird surveys as well but it's, it's it's expensive and there's just not really any way around that i i don't i can't i can't think of a a good easy technological fix right julia what about you no that was going to be something along the lines of my answer as well because we do have to some extent miniaturized radars that we can use for local experiments and we do stuff with that um when we're looking at, for instance, stadium lighting, um, we have something in the works for a project like that as well. And you know, we could put one on a boat, but like the funds need to exist. The the reason Birdcast is able to work is because we derive this data from radar stations that exist for weather surveillance purposes, not for birds. And there's a lot more funding for that. So to be able to survey birds in particular offshore, I think, you know, there needs to be more funding and more partnerships with NOAA and other research organizations that already have boats out there that we can stick um, radar onto. Yeah, that's very, very interesting. Um, okay, I have a, another question for Marcella. One of the things that you mentioned was trying to, the, your work trying to get some of these saline lakes established as a national park. Um, and given that you had mentioned before that many of the places that shorebirds like being are also places that humans like being. So I, I wonder if you could talk about some of the challenges around establishing public lands and making sure that, um, especially lands that are going to be used by both uh, threatened species and humans. Okay. Uh, yes, we are currently supporting the process of uh, a national park here at Mar Chiquita Lake, and I can speak about that process particularly. But um, yeah, I think that is um, that would be the one of the biggest uh, national park that we will have in the country, and is the high um, category of protection that we have here. And many people is uh, in favor of that, but also it raise some concerns about the some productive uh, areas or people that are uh, concerned about the activities that they will be able to um, to do if this become a national park because as you mentioned many human activities are sometimes like in conflict with the sites the shorebirds prefer but the good news is we can work together and find a way to for example for zoning the area to establish some uh, some specific areas that shorebirds are need to be because the food resources of the roosting habitat is there. And there is, for example, um, good practices for, I don't know, ranching or, or for activities that are related to productive, um, yeah, productive activities. So there is uh, 
there is a way to to work with the people to create a national park or a protected area and still be able to have benefits for for the, the area but making this balance between the protection of the habitat and the human use i don't know if i answer your question <laughs> but no i mean i think that's very helpful uh, especially um uh, the the question that i'm seeing here also wonders if how what role ecotourism and i guess i can open this up to to other folks as well you know what role does ecotourism and you know folks going specifically to look at birds what role does that play in helping to conserve some of these habitats yeah i i will take that and then leave it to my my colleagues uh here for example that are in in argentina in general i think in south america in general uh the bird watching is is comparatively comparatively new or lower than in for example in north america and it's growing in the last years so but it's growing that is a good news so for example when we are working to establish a national park or a protected area like here we are trying to um to work with the communities and to the government agencies to show them there is other opportunities besides the traditional tourism practices to to take like to be able to um, have benefits from the area, you know, for example, ecotourism here is very promoted by the, the, the local NGO that is leading the process of a national park. And they're trying to create this, um, this uh, regional brand and promote the ecotourism because that will be helpful for the people that live here and need uh, need the economic activities to, to, to support themselves, but also for the environment and the birds and all the wildlife. Uh, to add on to that question, I guess in my experience, I found that ecotourism can help um, build the political power of birders when working with government agencies to try and enact new policies. Um, and so you can make a more perhaps um, a better case to people who don't care about birds if you can talk about the the amount of money that ecotourism brings or the number of jobs that it creates in that region and i know some some bird or some conservationists get aggravated with that approach that you know that and, and yeah. i and i have i have been known to rant about that a little bit you know? <laughs> Birds matter. Period. You know the yes. whole question of economic ornithology. You know, back a hundred years ago, it was well, we have to protect these birds because they're you know we've dissected one hundred and fifty thousand stomachs, and these are the, this is the percentage of weed seeds. And seriously, that's what they did. Yeah. You know that they proved the value of birds by dissecting them and counting how many bad bugs they'd eaten. Oh God! Uh, but the fact is, you know, birds need every friend they can get right now, and you know, some people you're going to reach with with a conservation message, some people you're going to reach with an aesthetic message, and some people you're going to reach with an economic message. And if if we need if we need to play the economic card and show the the importance of birds that you know that that birders bring six million dollars into the economy of Port Arthur, Texas, and Galveston every year because they're visiting High Island, then let's make yeah. that argument. Um, you know, economics economics can be important. You know, you asked about you know one thing people can do to help birds. If you're a coffee drinker buy certified shade grown coffee, specifically bird friendly shade grown coffee certified by the Smithsonian Migratory Bird Center, because I have seen directly how that impacts bird conservation in Latin America. You know, in, in northern Nicaragua, around the, the community of San Juan del Rio Coco, there's a there's a, a, a cooperative of about 400 small family farmers, all of them bird friendly certified, which means they're also USDA organic certified. And the premium price that they get for their bird friendly certified coffee is allowing them to buy up and revegetate formerly denuded grain fields and cattle pastures, um, planting them with native forest vegetation to create new shade coffee plantations, but also creating new bird habitat. And um, it's really striking in the, in the over the, the years that I've been visiting that area of northern Nicaragua to see um, you know how how new bird habitat is blossoming down there, and that's directly because people in the U.S. and Canada are seeking out and buying certified shade grown coffee. So, you know, it's an economic um, it's an economic argument that's had you know boots on the ground impact for birds. 
Well, we and are. Then, oh, sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. No, 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 no Julie. I was just going to add on. No, I completely see where you're coming from that and the frustration with the economic argument. Sometimes I'm like frustrated pulling it out. But like we we work almost exclusively half the time with building owners and managers and mayors who really at the end of the day, their question for you is, why should I care? And, you know, we try and give them the birds connect everyone together, da, 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 all the things that we love about birds. And sometimes that message gets across and sometimes it doesn't. So, you know, I, I really want to emphasize what Scott said about birds needing every friend we can get and taking all the approaches and using all of the facts to our advantage that we can to try to implement this change. So if you're looking to implement sort of lights out or any other measure in your community, I do suggest trying to pull some facts about ecotourism or jobs or whatever. It's tended to be helpful in our specific case. Well, that actually leads to what uh, we are coming. <laughs> this event has gone so fast and there are so many more questions. Um, I'm going to ask one more specific audience question, and then I want to give each of y'all an opportunity to kind of give some sort of a closing statement, a closing thought to leave our uh, attendees with. But um, Julia, one of the questions or a series of questions that we're getting um, are about uh, looking into, we've got someone in Los Angeles who uh, the city recently changed their street lights to brighter LEDs. We have another person in Ohio who's talking about, um, who's wondering about using bird friendly glass in buildings. Um, it seems like there are, where is the best place for folks to find resources about what's actually working to help uh, adapt our built environment, all of these structures that humans have made. Um, and what kinds of resources do you are available to help get that information to the people that can actually make the changes on a on an agency and government level? Gotcha. Um, okay, so I'll try to move through that pretty quickly. So there are a lot of resources on the BirdCast website. If you go to Science to Action and our Lights Out page, we provide lighting guidelines and basic things like that. Um, you can also learn more about um, bird-friendly lighting by looking into dark skies lighting. There's a lot of resources on dark skies websites, so I suggest those as well. And there's also a lot of resources on uh, FLAP's website, um, as they were the progenitor of the Lights Out movement here in North America, and there's a ton of information that they provide, so I suggest looking into that. Ultimately, um, sort of my answer to these questions, LEDs, not great for most ecology. Um, not great, not bird friendly. Um, what was the other, sorry, what was the other question? The specific one? About bird friendly glass and other okay, ways that yeah. we can adapt um, skyscrapers, yeah. for example. Bird friendly glass is amazing. We're trying to add these into as many codes as we can, but it's just, it's another cost. A lot of people aren't willing to retrofit and um, there's a lot of other ways that buildings can get LEED certifications than um, adding in bird friendly measures. So it's about sort of forcing and incentivizing those measures as much as possible, as well as raising awareness, I think, in architecture schools about how it's necessary to be bird friendly, to be environmentally friendly. Um, and so that's all a sort of systemic change issue that I think we need to tackle. And I hope that um, our resources, as well as the resources I mentioned, can start getting you um, aware about the solutions that are out there. Because I think at the end of the day, there's been a lot of research done about the solutions. Our question now is implementation. Um, so the Bert Lights Out Texas project is one that we're piloting our involvement in to sort of figure out what is the best way to connect with agencies and sort of advocate this message to implement change. Um, we are going to be adding more resources that we personally use at the end of our two-year pilot onto our BirdCast website. And you can also, in the interim, directly contact um, using the email I provided um, or email anyone at BirdCast to be directed to me, and we can help you uh, situate a program for your area. Great. Well, we have already come to the end of time. Well, could we phrase that? The end of our time. Wow, that's dramatic. <laughs> yeah, uh, apologize for that. Uh, I wanna make sure that I give you all an opportunity to, to say some final thoughts, anything that you wanna leave our audience with before, before we go. So um, we will go in the order that I gave questions. So Julia and then Marcella and then Scott. 
Uh, I guess touching on some of the themes we talked a bit about, the challenges are many, but there's a lot of hope and there's a lot that the individual person can do, um, including turning out your lights, but many other things, as we've mentioned already. So I hope that not only do you do those, but you try and talk to your neighbors and your friends about that. So more and more people can be friends to birds as well. Yeah, well, I agree with Julia. I think there is uh, many things that you can do, like in a bigger scale or, or individually at your home or in your, uh, where you do when you go walk to the beach or, or, or the lights or the glasses and everything. But also I think that it's very important that we share everything that we learn and we try to get involved as, as much people as we can, our familiars, our neighbors, our friends, everybody. Uh, my, more people is knowing about this and more people will be doing, uh, contributing to the protection of the migratory birds. So that will be my, my comments. And I just, just to pick up on, on all of that, we, we, should, we should all make a, a little bit of a vow or a promise to ourselves you know, at every opportunity to show a bird to somebody who's never seen one. Um, you know, to, uh, I, I, have, I have a longstanding habit of kind of grabbing people by the neck as they're walking by and saying, look at this, look at this, and handing them a pair of binoculars or letting them see through the scope. And it's remarkable how many times people get hooked on that. We just, they've just never had the opportunity. And, you know, to come back to the, you know, birds need every friend they can, they can get right now. Um, you know, we, we, we should all be active ambassadors for birds all the time. Excellent. Um, okay, well, um, I am getting the message that we are now at time. Um, I want to thank everyone, first of all, all of our incredible panelists for taking the time to talk with us, uh, to all of our listeners about your incredible wealth of knowledge about bird migration. Um, I am very excited for everyone who came to attend. Um, we have more resources uh, as we have so many resources in the chat, but for more information, please do visit the bird note website, which is birdnote.org. Um, many of the stories that we discussed here in this panel um, were part of the migration series that you can listen to now. And there are also additional updates, uh, including our podcast threatened which uh, Scott is, is featured in an episode of. So please do check out the website and thank you so much for coming. <laughs> <laughs>